And we're sitting there and uh, just shooting the breeze. And he said, just out of a blue sky, that dirty swine had me flown out of the United States to Guatemala. He wasn't mad at the president. He was mad at his brother. But he knew that if he could get to the president, it was the end of the attorney general. In these sort of things, Marcelo was no dummy. You know, when it comes to murder and planning things and crime and dirty things, he was a genius. And we're sitting there and uh, he said, I'm going to tell you something. I had the little bastard killed and I would do it again. He was a thorn in my shoe. I quote, Marcelo realized what he had said. And, you know, we started talking about other things. In my guts, I was so shocked and horrified. I knew that I had had enough, and I, I couldn't tolerate too much more of this. In the midst of a dimly lit room, the air was thick with tension. Santos Traficante, a man shrouded in shadows, sat before the committee, his eyes reflecting a lifetime of secrets and clandestine dealings. The committee's investigation into a potential link between organized crime and the assassination of President Kennedy had brought him here, to this moment. Chairman Stokes, a stern figure, began the questioning. He probed Traficanti's memory, seeking answers about his association with certain individuals and the nature of his conversations. The committee needed to know whether there was any evidence to suggest that organized crime had played a role in the tragic events that unfolded on that fateful day in Dallas. Traficante's responses were enigmatic, his memory elusive. He acknowledged knowing figures like Louis McWillie and Carlos Marcello, figures that had long been associated with the world of organized crime. His recollections were hazy, and the past seemed to blur into the present. The chairman pressed on, asking about his knowledge of Jack Ruby. Traficante denied any direct connection to Ruby and vehemently denied any prior knowledge of President Kennedy's assassination. He stressed that he had never met Lee Harvey Oswald, the man accused of the assassination. As the interrogation delved deeper, the focus shifted to Jose Alaman, a man whose name had surfaced in connection to a loan discussed in hushed tones. Traficante recounted a series of meetings, highlighting the complexities of his interactions with Alaman and other associates. The meetings held the promise of business deals, involving export licenses for milk from the Dominican Republic, all while Alleman faced financial turmoil. However, Traficante was emphatic in his denial of ever making the incendiary statement that Kennedy would be hit. He explained that his conversations with Alleman had been in Spanish, and his grasp of the language rendered such a statement highly unlikely. Chairman Stokes scrutinized Traficante's assertion, but Traficante held firm. He maintained that while he might have discussed Kennedy's chances of re-election, he had never alluded to a sinister plot against the president. As the testimony unfolded, it became clear that the committee was chasing shadows. Traficante's evasive answers and the elusive nature of the past left the connection between organized crime and the Kennedy assassination shrouded in uncertainty. The questions that had led to this moment still lingered, unanswered. In the end, the enigmatic figure of Santos Traficante remained a cryptic chapter in the enduring mystery of President Kennedy's assassination. The room fell silent, and the shadows of history concealed their secrets, leaving the truth hidden within the echoes of the past. Here is his full testimony. Santo Traficante is further required to appear when subpoenaed by the committee, testify, and provide the information sought with regard to matters under investigation by the committee. It is also ordered that no testimony or information compelled under this order, or any information directly or indirectly derived from such testimony or information, may be used against Santo Traficante in any criminal case.
except for a prosecution for perjury, making a false statement, or failing to comply with this order. This order is intended to ensure that Mr. Santo Traficante cooperates with the Select Committee on Assassinations while safeguarding his Fifth Amendment rights against self-incrimination. The Select Committee or a subcommittee thereof is authorized and directed to conduct a full and complete investigation and study of the circumstances surrounding the assassination and death of President John F. Kennedy and the assassination and death of Martin Luther King and of any other persons the Select Committee shall determine might be related to either death in order to ascertain whether the existing laws of the United States, including but not limited to laws relating to the safety and protection of the President of the United States, assassinations of the President of the United States, deprivation of civil rights and conspiracies related thereto, as well as the investigatory jurisdiction and capability of agencies and departments of the U.S. government, are adequate either in their provisions or in the manner of their enforcement and whether there was full disclosure and sharing of information and evidence among agencies and departments of the U.S. government during the course of all, prior investigations into those deaths, and whether any evidence or information, which was not, in the possession of any agency or department of the U.S., government investigating either death would have been of assistance to that agency or department, and why such information was not provided to or collected by the appropriate agency or department and shall make recommendations to the House, if the Select Committee deems it appropriate for the amendment of existing legislation or the enactment of new legislation. The Chair recognises Mr. Stokes to begin the questioning. Proceed with the questioning at this time. Chairman Stokes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Traficante. I believe at the point you interjected your motion. I had asked you to tell us when and where you were born. Traficante. Tampa, Fla. November 15th, 1914. Chairman Stokes. What is your current occupation? Traficante. I am retired. Chairman Stokes. During the period 1957 and 1958, where were you living? Traficante. In Havana, Cuba. Chairman Stokes. Could you tell us when you moved to Cuba? Traficante. Around 1953 or 1954, in the latter part of 1953 or 1954. Chairman Stokes. Now, during 1959, did you travel between the United States and Cuba? Traficante. I do not think I did. Maybe. In the latter part of 1959, I might have. Chairman Stokes. Can you tell us what business or employment you had while you were in Cuba? Traficante. I was in the gambling business and nightclub casino business, which was legal at that time in Cuba. Chairman Stokes. Being in the business, did you own several pieces of casinos in Cuba? Traficante. I had some interest in some casinos. Chairman Stokes. Can you tell us how many? Traficante. Well, maybe three or four. Chairman Stokes. Did you have an interest in the San Susi? Traficante. Yes. Chairman Stokes. How about the Tropicana? Traficante. No. Chairman Stokes. Capri. Traficante. No. Chairman Stokes. Which were the others you had an interest in? Traficante. Deauville the Commodore. Chairman Stokes. In order to operate your casinos in 1957-58, did you have to pay money to Cuban officials to maintain the operation of your casinos? Mr. Traficante. We had to pay a license of $25,000 a year, and we had to give 50% of the take of the slot machines. Chairman Stokes, Mr. Traficante, do you know a Rafael Jenner while you were in Cuba? Mr. Traficante, I did not get the name. Chairman Stokes, Jenner, Rafael Jenner. Mr. Traficante, how do you spell it? Chairman Stokes, it is spelled G-E-N-E-R, but pronounced Jenner. Mr. Traficante. P-E, you said. Chairman Stokes, G, as in George. G-E-N-E-R, but is pronounced Jenner. Mr. Traficante. Jenner. Macho. Jenner. Yes, I knew a Gina by that name. Chairman Stokes. Did you meet him while in Cuba? Mr. Traficante. I met him after the event of Fidel Castro. He had been in exile before. Chairman Stokes. This would be after the revolution? 
Mr. Trafficante. Right. Chairman Stokes, Mr. Trafficante. Did you know a Mr. Joseph Stasi? Mr. Trafficante. Yes. Chairman Stokes. How did you come to know him? Mr. Trafficante. He was connected with me for a while in the San Susi. Chairman Stokes. What was his relationship to you? Mr. Trafficante. He was a partner in the San Susi. Chairman Stokes, can you tell us in late 1958, what was the result of the activities of Castro? How did it affect the tourist and gambling business there in Havana? Mr. Trafficante, you are talking about 1958 before Castro came in? Chairman Stokes, before he came in, yes. Mr. Trafficante, it was not too good. Every other day they had bombs and stuff like that, it was nothing. Chairman Stokes, what effect did it have on the gambling business? How did it affect your business? Mr. Trafficante, very bad. Mr. Trafficante, because every day there were bombs put in different spots, and the first thing you know, even if there were a couple bombs, before the night was over, there were 200, supposedly, rumours, stuff flying around, and people would stay home. Chairman Stokes, I suppose that this then caused the casino operators a great deal of concern, did it not? Mr. Trafficante, I suppose so. Chairman Stokes, and was there fear on the part of the operators that if Castro came to power that he would confiscate these businesses? Mr. Trafficante, no. Chairman Stokes, was there anticipated at all that he might come to power at that time? Mr. Trafficante, nobody ever dreamt that he would come to power at that time. Chairman Stokes, did you or any of the other casino operators take any steps to protect your businesses in the event that he would come to power? Mr. Trafficante, no, there was no question about him taking power. They used to, in the papers, when you would read about him, you would read like he was some kind of a bandit. Chairman Stokes, did you meet Fidel or Raul Castro prior to January 1st, 1959? Mr. Trafficante. No. Chairman Stokes. When Fidel Castro took over, how soon did he order the casinos to be closed? Mr. Trafficante. Well, even before he reached Havana, because he didn't come down from the mountain until after Batista had left, and he had a walkathon, you would call it, from the mountains to Havana. And they kept interviewing him and he kept saying the casinos would close. Statements to that effect the casinos close without even being notified officially to close. Everything was in turmoil. There were people all over the streets breaking into homes. There was complete enmity. And the only thing at that time was to try and stay alive. Chairman Stokes. What was his attitude toward casino owners and operators? Mr. Trafficante. Well, he did a lot of talking in those days. I doubt if he knew what he was talking about, but he used to do a lot of talking against the Marines, the United States, and this and that. So, nobody knew where you stood with him. Chairman Stokes. About that time, did you have any reason to contact Mr. Gina, whom we have referred to earlier, the gentleman we referred to earlier? Mr. Trafficante. Mr. Gina contacted me to say if my recollection is right. In fact, it was looking to take over the apartment that I used to live, because he thought it was a matter of time before I would have to leave Cuba. Chairman Stokes, after Mr. Trafficante. That is how I got to meet him. I met him in my own apartment, and in case, he said, if you left, I would like to have this apartment. So I say, OK. Chairman Stokes. After Castro came to power, did you continue to operate your business as usual? Mr. Trafficante. No, everything was closed, but after two, maybe three months, or four months or five months, I don't remember when, he ordered all the casinos to open up again, and when I said order, he ordered it. You either had to open up or lose, or go to jail. Chairman Stokes. And what did you do? Mr. Trafficante. Well, I stayed away from the San Susi, which was a lemon, so I stood around there to see what would happen, mostly to see he closed the door there. What he did was, he made the casinos open, and he obligated all the casinos' owners 
to pay the back pay of all these months that these people had not worked, and as soon as they got the back pay, then he will find a reason to close them. Some of them, the ones he considered that were in the middle district of the city or the poor district of the city. Chairman Stokes. This would have meant then that anyone who reopened would have to pay those employees about three months' wages. Is that right? Mr. Traficante. About three or four months' wages, yes. Chairman Stokes. Did a time come when you were detained or imprisoned there in Cuba? Mr. Traficante. Yes. Chairman Stokes. And can you tell us when that was? Mr. Traficante. I cannot tell you the exact date, but the thing was that I was detained. I was being, how would you call it, conferred with counsel. I got news that Cuban officials were looking for me to put me in jail, because one of the things was that I was a Batista collaborator. They raided my apartment. They were looking for money. They tore up all the furniture. They used to get me at night time, take me out in the woods, trying to tell me where I had my money, this and that, until I finally went into hiding. And they kept on, and nobody knew what was going on. I mean, these were a bunch of most of them were 15, 16, 17 years old. They had weapons. It was a bad time to be around there. Chairman Stokes. Now do the dates, June 8 to August 18, 1959. Sound about the time that you were imprisoned? Mr. Traficanti. Well, no, I was imprisoned on June the 21st. I was there because one of my daughters got married on that day, and I had been in jail before. I had been in jail, I would say, at least a month or two. They let me out that day to go to the wedding, because the thing was that these people thought, when they finally arrested me, they thought that I was being, that I was wanted in the United States, for all kinds of charges. Narcotics. There were this and that. And when they check it out, they found out nobody wanted me in the States. So then they had me in Triscornia, which was immigration centre, and they did not know there for a while what to do with me. And I think that the reason they later did not deport me was because the United States wanted for them to deport me. So they figured, well, they said, this guy cannot be because at that time everybody to them was a spy, was this, was that. Chairman Stokes. So it was not actually like a prison, was it? Mr. Traficanti. No, it was not. We had it pretty good. Mr. Prayer, you had it pretty good? Mr. Traficanti, we had it pretty good. We had our own food coming in and everything. It was like a big camp, like a big concentration camp. We had our own room. It was not too bad. Chairman Stokes, and can you give us some idea about how many persons were being detained there at that time? Mr. Traficanti, well, they had two sides to this thing. They had, most of these people, a lot of these people, entered Cuba with no papers, especially sailors and people with no means of support. They would put them on one side, and people that they thought had means of support that were not public charges, they would put them on the other side. I think at one time in our compound, you would call it, I think, we got to be about seven or eight. Chairman Stokes. Were those other seven or eight also casino owners and operators? Mr. Traficante. Most of them were workers or casino owners. Chairman Stokes. Did you know most of them? Mr. Traficante. Yes. Chairman Stokes. Can you tell us who they were? Mr. Traficante. Well, for a time there, I would say for a day or two, there was Mr. Dino Cellini. Mr. Jake Lansky and myself, a fellow by the name of Chuck White, Giuseppe Di George, and that is about it. Chairman Stokes. Now, had you known all of these people before you went to the compound with them? Mr. Traficante. Yes, sir. I found most of them there. Then in a few days Mr. Lansky and Mr. Cellini were taken out, and they were freed. In other words, they were not deported or anything. Chairman Stokes. Mr. Traficante, did you contact anyone to assist you in getting out of the detention center? Mr. Traficante, I had a lot of people come and see me trying to help me to get out, and the attorney that I had was a fellow by the name of Mr. Bango, and I think Mr. Gina was interested in getting me out, and a lot of other people that were in the casino business, native people, 
like Mr. Fox and Mr. Peter and Mr. Alfredo Gonzalez and Mr. Raul Gonzalez. We had a good relationship, and they all tried their best to get me out. Chairman Stokes, at the time you were released, were any of the other casino operators or owners released with you? Mr. Traficante, most of them had been released except this fellow Giuseppe Di George, who was deported to Italy. He was held there for deportation to Italy because he was an Italian citizen. Chairman Stokes, in order to effect your release, did you have to pay any money? Mr. Traficante, no, sir. Chairman Stokes, did Raul Castro have anything to do with your release? Mr. Traficante, he helped in my release. Chairman Stokes, at least you have heard that he did? Mr. Traficante, well, no, I had a friend of mine by the name of Raul Gonzalez, who used to run the Hilton Hotel, where Raul Castro used to go very frequently, and he talked to him one day about me, and the fellow says, well, I understand he is in the drug business. And this fellow told him, if he is in the drug business, then you get me and shoot me against the wall because I can vouch for him. He says, well, you wait a while. I see what I can do about it. And eventually, after a month or two, I was released. Chairman Stokes, and after you were released, Mr. Traficante, how long did you remain in Havana? Mr. Traficante, I remained in Havana until, I am not sure now, I had a case, I had a trial coming up in Jacksonville, Fla, on a tax matter. So I came in for that trial. I believe it was the latter part of 1959, the month of October or November. I don't remember when. It lasted about eight weeks. I was acquitted. Then I spent the holidays, I think, in Florida. Then I went back to Havana. Chairman Stokes. When you returned to Havana, what was you are feeling about the climate there in terms of the economy and your investment in the casino operations? Mr. Traficante. Very bad. I knew sooner or later I would have to get out of there. Chairman Stokes. After your release from prison, did you ever meet Raul or Fidel Castro? Mr. Traficante. I met Raul Castro one time at the Hilton Hotel. I happened to be there, in fact. And the same Raul Gonzalez, he has told me, if you want to thank him, he is upstairs, in some kind of a place, some kind of a room there, like a public bar or something. And so I went up there and he was going down the stairs, so this fellow called to him and made him stop. And I went there and I thanked him. And he said, well, just behave and don't give nothing to nobody. Don't let nobody shake you down or nothing like that. And just behave and you will be all right here. You don't have to leave, you don't have to go, no place. Chairman Stokes, this was Raoul. You are talking about Mr. Traficante, Raoul, Fidel Castro. I used to see him practically every night in front of the Hilton, where he used to come in about two or three o'clock in the morning, and the first thing you know there were... He liked to talk to the people in the streets. First thing you know there were four hundred or five hundred people at three or four o'clock in the morning and he would be talking all night long, and I used to watch him too, with the rest of the people. I never did talk to him, though. Chairman Stokes. You never did talk with him? Mr. Traficante. No. And the only one that talked to him was, while I was in jail, my wife, who wanted to get permission for me to see my daughter if he would let me out of jail to give my daughter away. She was supposed to be married. Chairman Stokes. And he granted that request? Mr. Traficante. And he did. He granted the request with a lot of protection and a lot of bodyguards, thinking I would run away or something I do not know. Chairman Stokes. After you got out of Trescornia, did you reopen your casino business? Mr. Traficante. No, I did not reopen. I stayed away from the Sans Souci completely. The only thing that the Commodore was still open and I had an interest in the Commodore and the Deauville. He kept it open until all the workers were paid, and then he closed that. So anyhow, the thing was that the dollar started getting stronger, and the Cuban peso started getting weaker, and it was cheap to live there, and I knew people there and I felt comfortable there, as long as I didn't see nothing out of the way. But the further, the more time passed, I could see that I had to leave there. There was nothing there for me. 
there was going to be trouble there. Everybody was getting arrested and nobody was safe. So around the middle of 1960 I made out. I was coming to the States for just a visit and I never went back. Chairman Stokes. Well, you had quite a bit of money invested in your operations there, didn't you? Mr. Trafficanti. No, I would not say I had too much money invested. Chairman Stokes. Did you do anything in terms of getting your money out and getting it back to the States? Mr. Trafficante. No, because at that time most of the money that I had there was Cuban money, and at the time that I left it was worth about ten to one, Chairman Stokes. That is ten. Mr. Trafficante. Ten pesos to one dollars. Chairman Stokes. To one less. So you were suffering quite a loss then? Mr. Trafficante. I would not say I did. I was young, I had a good time, and that was it. I chucked it off to experience. Chairman Stokes. Are you familiar with what the other casino operators did in terms of trying to get their investments out? Mr. Trafficante. No, I am not. Chairman Stokes. Now, after you returned to the States the last time you referred to, when you left in the middle of 1960? Mr. Trafficante. Yes, I think around the middle of 1960. Chairman Stokes. Then, of course, you never went back? Mr. Trafficante. No, sir. Chairman Stokes. Now, you just said that in terms of your investment, you did not feel that it was too much. Can you give us some idea what you feel your loss was? Mr. Trafficante. No, I cannot give you no idea. Chairman Stokes. Was it a little bit of money or a lot of money? Mr. Trafficante. No, it was not no little bit and it wasn't too much either. Chairman Stokes. Well, are we talking about thousands of dollars or millions of dollars? Mr. Trafficante. You are talking about thousands. Chairman Stokes. Well, when you consider all four of the places in which you had an interest, would you say that collectively your investment could have been over a million dollars? Mr. Trafficante. No. Chairman Stokes. If I told you, Mr. Traficante, that Mr. Ricardo Escartain, who is the current Cuban consul and first secretary in Washington, told the committee that their records indicate, for example, that the net profit of the Riviera Hotel was $25 million in 1958, would you say that was a true statement? Mr. Traficante, I could not tell you because I did not have nothing to do with the Riviera Hotel. Chairman Stokes, when you left Cuba, where did you next live? Mr. Trafficante. I lived in Miami. Chairman Stokes. Mr. Trafficante. When was the first time you were ever approached by any individual who was affiliated with or working for the Central Intelligence Agency? Mr. Trafficante. It was around either the latter part of 1960 or the first part of 1961. Chairman Stokes. And can you tell us who was the person who first contacted you? Mr. Trafficante. Mr. John Rosselli, Chairman Stokes, and where did he approach you? Mr. Trafficante, we were in the Fontainebleau Hotel, Chairman Stokes, and can you give us the date? Mr. Trafficante, no, Chairman Stokes, can you approximate the time? Mr. Trafficante, I told you it was either the latter part of 1960 or the first part of 1961, Chairman Stokes. Did you know Mr. Roselli before that date? Mr. Trafficante. Yes, I had met him. Chairman Stokes. Can you tell us how you knew him? Mr. Trafficante. Well, at this moment, I do not remember how I met him, but I knew him. Chairman Stokes. And how long had you known him? Mr. Trafficante. I would say about 15 years, 15, 16 years. Chairman Stokes. Now, had Mr. Roselli ever had any business interests in Cuba? Mr. Trafficante. No. Chairman Stokes. Over the period of time that you had known him, how often had you and he come into contact? Mr. Trafficante. Very few. Chairman Stokes. Now, did he tell you how he came to be affiliated with the CIA? Mr. Trafficante. No. Chairman Stokes. This first meeting was just between the two of you? Mr. Trafficante. Yes, the first time, yes. Chairman Stokes. 
Can you tell us the substance of the conversation you had with him? Mr. Traficante. Well, he told me that CIA and the United States government was involved in eliminating Castro. And if I would happen, and if Mr. Gina, if Mr. Macho Jenna, if I knew about him, knew what kind of man he was, I told him he was a good man. He was against Castro anyhow. And that is about it. Then he introduced me to Mr. Mahu, and then Mr. Giancana came into the picture. Chairman Stokes. Mr. Who. Mr. Traficante. Giancana. Mr. Roselli wanted me to be more or less an interpreter in the situation, because he couldn't speak Spanish and I can speak Spanish fluently. Chairman Stokes. How long after the first meeting you had with Roselli did the second meeting occur with Mahu and then Giancana? Mr. Traficante? They were all staying at the Fontainebleau Hotel. It was a matter of days. Chairman Stokes. What was your reaction to killing President Castro? Mr. Traficante. Well, at that time it was a good thing because he had established a communistic base 90 miles from the United States. And being that the government of the United States wanted it done, I go along with it. The same thing as a war. I figure it was like a war. Chairman Stokes. Now obviously Mr. Roselli, in order to approach you and discuss this with you, trusted you, right? Mr. Traficante. Yes. Chairman Stokes. All in all, can you give us some idea about how many meetings took place between the group? Mr. Traficante. Not too many because just like I tell you, they used me to be an interpreter, and then we met Mr. Gina. Then I took him to a place where they met some Cubans who were very active, supposedly leaders of the American-backed factions, who were in charge of trying to eliminate Castro through revolution, or any other way that they could. And I think I assisted a couple of times, and that is the only thing I can say about that. Chairman Stokes. Well, since you were going to be the interpreter, it would be necessary for you to be present at all of the meetings in order to interpret the conversations. Right? Mr. Traficante. Yes. But after a couple of meetings, they found out that they could get along without me, I guess, and they told me they didn't need my services anymore. And that was the last that I, when they told me that I back it off, I wasn't going to Chairman Stokes. Now, what was the total time span that you were involved in the discussions about killing Castro? Mr. Traficante, I cannot, I cannot, I could not be truthful with you. I could not, I would say it would be a matter of about a month or a month and a half or two months. We are going back a long time now. I used to see Mahu, I used to see Mr. Roselli, I used to see Giancana at the Fontainebleau, but there was no discussion. I might meet him at a bar or the lounge and have a drink or something like that, but there would be no more discussions about the Castro thing. Chairman Stokes When you would have these meetings about assassinating Castro, would you have discussions about other things too? Mr. Traficanti. Not that I remember. Chairman Stokes. Was Sam Giancana in the Miami area all the time that these meetings were taking place? Mr. Traficanti. Yes, he was, he was there. Chairman Stokes. And what was, Mr. Traficanti? He might leave, I guess, and come back or something, but he was there most of the time. Chairman Stokes. What was your connection with Sam Giancana? Mr. Traficante. I happen to know Mr. Giancana. There was no connection at all. Chairman Stokes. How long had you known him? Mr. Traficante. Oh, I would say about 10 or 15 years too. Chairman Stokes. Was he fully aware of the plot to assassinate Castro? Mr. Traficante. Yes. Chairman Stokes. And exactly how did he become aware of it? Mr. Traficante, I do not know. I do not know how he became aware unless... I think it was through Mr. Roselli that brought him in, Cherma Stokis. And do you know what his role was supposed to be in the assassination, Mr. Traficante? No, I do not. Chairman Stokis, do you know if Giancana had directed Roselli to contact you in regard to this operation? Mr. Traficante, I do not know. Maybe he did. It could be possible. Chairman Stokes, can you tell us why Roselli approached you? Mr. Traficante, well, he knew I had been in Cuba. He figured I had. I knew people there. 
He thought I could be of help. I spoke the language. He did not. He had to deal with Cuban people. I thought he figured he could trust me. Chairman Stokes. When he came to you and talked about the CIA, what did he say to you? Mr. Traficante. Well, I cannot tell the exact words what he said to me, but more or less he was working for him, and Mr. Mahu were with the CIA, and that they were working for the CIA, and that the United States government wanted this thing done. That is what he said to me. Chairman Stokes. Did he say what his role or capacity was with the CIA? Mr. Traficante. He made me understand he was an agent of the CIA. Chairman Stokes. Now what was your total involvement to be in the assassination plot? Mr. Traficante. My total involvement was to be the interpreter between Mr. Roselli, Mr. Mahu, and these Cuban people that I took them to. Mr. Gaynor suggested that we see, and that I remember driving them there maybe a couple of times. Chairman Stokes. Driving them where? Mr. Traficante. To the home of this Cuban leader that was supposed to be backed by the American government in the attempt to get rid of Castro. Chairman Stokes. And what was Mr. Gina's role to be? Mr. Traficante. Well, he made the introduction to everybody with this gentleman. Chairman Stokes. Who brought Genere into the operation? Mr. Traficante. How was that? Chairman Stokes. Who brought Genere into the operation? Mr. Traficante. Roselli asked me about him, and evidently he had heard about Gina. I could not tell you who brought him in, but I told him he was all right. I thought he was all right anyhow. Chairman Stokes. Well, in light of the fact that you knew Gina in Cuba, where you had business operations, and you have told us that Roselli had no business operations in Cuba. Mr. Traficanti. That is right. Chairman Stokes. How would Roselli come to know Gina? Mr. Traficanti. Well, the only way I can figure out is that Jenna was very active in the campaign against Castro, and Roselli was looking for people that were active in the campaign against Castro, and somehow he heard about them, or they got together some kind of way. Chairman Stokes. But the person who would have more knowledge about Jaina and others who were involved would be you, isn't that true? Mr. Traficante. I do not see why I should have been the only one. He asked me about him before he talked to him, I think. Chairman Stokes. Okay. Mr. Traficante. And the CIA probably knew about Gina and had some connection with Jenna and asked me something. I am telling you the truth of what I know about it and how he came about and how it came about. I do not know how, but it came about. Chairman Stokes. At any rate, you told him Janair was, okay, Mr. Traficante. That is right. Chairman Stokes. Now I want to make reference to a person whom we will refer to in conversation as Y. You know whom I'm talking about, don't you? Mr. Traficante. Right. Chairman Stokes. The reason we are using this is because this person's name has not been declassified. Mr. Traficante. Right. Chairman Stokes. You understand that? Mr. Traficante. Right. Chairman Stokes. Prior to any questions on this point, I want to state this. The Church Committee in their report, page 80, described this particular person as, quote, a leading figure in the Cuban exile movement. Now, when did you first meet Y, Mr. Traficante? Mr. Traficante. I met him through Mr. Gina when I took Maho and Mr. Roselli. I drove the car, Chairman Stokes. You had not met him previously? Mr. Traficante. I had not met him previously. Maybe I had seen him in Cuba, but I had never met him or talked to him. Chairman Stokes. Who brought Mr. Y into the plot? Mr. Traficante. Gina. Chairman Stokes. What was Mr. Y's role to be? Mr. Traficante. He was one of the leaders of the American-backed faction, of the movement against Castro in the United States. He was one of the top leaders. Chairman Stokes. Did Mr. Y speak both Spanish and English? Mr. Traficante. I doubt it, no. He spoke Spanish because I was there. I interpreted for him, especially the first time. 
Chairman Stokes. He was one of the people for whom you interpreted. Mr. Traficante. Right. He was the only person who I interpreted. Chairman Stokes. Now did Mr. Y ever ask you for assistance in financing anti-Castro activities? Mr. Traficante. No, I have not seen Mr. Y a couple of times it was. I do not think it was more than two times, could have been three, but I doubt it. I have not seen him since then. Chairman Stokes. Did you ever ask Mr. Y if he would be interested in participating in this? Mr. Traficante. How was that? Chairman Stokes. Did you ever ask Mr. Y if he would be willing to participate in this plot? Mr. Traficante. No, sir. No, sir. Chairman Stokes. Did you ever tell Mr. Y that you knew people who would pay money to do away with Castro? Mr. Traficante. No, sir. Chairman Stokes. Did you ever offer Mr. Y assistance of any type, in conjunction with any anti-Castro activities in which he was engaged? Mr. Traficante. No, sir. Chairman Stokes. Did you ever discuss with Mr. Y who would run the gambling businesses in Cuba in the event that Castro was overturned? Mr. Traficante. No. Chairman Stokes. Now it is your statement that at all times your sole function was to interpret for this group. Mr. Traficante. Yes, sir. Chairman Stokes. Is that correct? Mr. Traficante. Yes, sir. Chairman Stokes. Mr. Traficante, I want to read a portion of a declassified CIA Inspector General's report, 1967. I am reading at pages 29 and 31 of that document. Roselli told Support Chief that Traficante knew of a man high up in the Cuban exile movement who might do the job. He identified him as Mr. Y. The report then goes on to say this. Comment. Reports from the FBI suggest how Traficante may have known of I.E. On 21st December 1960, Bureau forwarded to the agency a memorandum reporting that U.S. racketeers were making efforts to finance anti-Castro activities in hopes of securing gambling, prostitution and dope monopolies in Cuba in the event Castro was overthrown. A report of January 18, 1961 also associated Y with these schemes. The 1967 Inspector General's report continues. Traficante approached Yi and told him that he had clients who wanted to do away with Castro and that they would pay big money for the job. Yishi is reported to have been very receptive since it would mean that he would be able to buy his own ships, arms and communications equipment. Mr. Traficante, having heard what the Inspector General of the CIA had to say about your involvement, is your answer still the same? Mr. Traficante. Absolutely the same. Chairman Stokes. When you were asked to interpret for these persons who were plotting, what method was discussed of how they were going to eliminate Castro? Mr. Traficante. Anyway, where did they take a cannon, pills, tanks, airplanes, anything? Chairman Stokes. Was there discussion about poison pills? Mr. Traficante. There was discussion of pills, yes sir. I am telling you any kind of way that was possible to get rid of him. There was not only one way of the pills, any kind of way, pills included. Chairman Stokes. Let me confine my question at this point to the pills. Who proposed the pills? Mr. Traficante. I know I did not. Chairman Stokes. My question was who did? Mr. Traficante. I do not know if it was Mahu or Roselli. Chairman Stokes. And were the pills ever given to anyone? Mr. Traficante. They were, but I do not recall me being present when they were. Chairman Stokes. Can you tell us when and where the pills were given to someone? Mr. Traficante. I do not recall me being present when the pills were given. Chairman Stokes. Can you tell us who was to administer the pills to Castro? Mr. Traficante. The pills to Castro were supposed to be administrated by Mr. X, Chairman Stokes. Was any money discussed in conjunction with this? Mr. Traficante. There was never no money discussed for none of these activities in no way, shape or form in my presence. Chairman Stokes. 
You mentioned all the different ways that would be utilized to get rid of Castro. Did anyone ever supply any of the arms or ammunition, or the tanks or the airplanes to them for that purpose? Mr. Trafficanti. I heard later, after this Bay of Pigs, they still kept on sending arms and boats and explosives and stuff like that. But I'm not sure. I just heard that from Mr. Roselli. Later on, years later. Chairman Stokes. Now I want to make reference to Mr. X, for reasons that his name is also not declassified. You know about whom I am talking? Mr. Trafficante. Right. Chairman Stokes. Now I want to also make reference to the fact, before I pose any questions, that the Church Committee in their interim report at page 80 described this person as a Cuban official close to Castro, who may have received kickbacks from the gambling interests. Now, you do know Mr. X? Mr. Traficante, I think I have spoken to Mr. X. Met him one time in Havana. Chairman Stokes. And what was your relationship to him? Mr. Traficante. I never gave him any money. Chairman Stokes. Well, what relationship did you have after you met him? Mr. Traficante. I did not have no relationship with him. The relationship was through Mr. Gina. Chairman Stokes. What was Mr. X's involvement in these plots? Mr. Traficante. Well, he was going to take care of the pills. Chairman Stokes. To take care of the pills? Mr. Traficante. Yes. Chairman Stokes. Do you know if Mr. X spoke both Spanish and English? Mr. Traficante. No, I do not. I know he is a professor, so it is possible that he spoke. But Mr. X, in this particular time, was still in Cuba, though. He wasn't in the United States. Chairman Stokes. Okay. You knew Mr. X from the time you spent in Cuba, is that right? Mr. Traficante. I met him one time. Chairman Stokes. I see. Mr. Traficante. I did not give him any money either. Chairman Stokes. Mr. Traficante, did you ever handle or carry poison pills to be used in the assassination of Castro? Mr. Traficante. No, sir, absolutely not. Chairman Stokes. Did Roselli ever give you the poison pills? Mr. Traficante. No, sir. Chairman Stokes. Again, I want to read to you from the CIA Inspector General's Report of 1967, pages 24 and 25. Comment. The gangsters may have had some influence on the choice of a means of assassination. Support Chief says that in his very early discussions with the gangsters, or more precisely Mahu's discussions with them, consideration was given to possible ways of accomplishing the mission. Apparently, the agency had first thought in terms of a typical gangland style of killing in which Castro would be gunned down. Giancana was flatly opposed to the use of firearms. He said that no one could be recruited to do the job because the chance of survival and escape would be negligible. Giancana stated a preference for a lethal pill that could be put into Castro's food or drink. Traficante Joe the Courier was in touch with a disaffected Cuba official with access to Castro and presumably of a sort that would enable him to surreptitiously poison Castro. The gangsters said, X had once been in a position to receive kickbacks from the gambling interests, had since lost that source of income and needed the money. Having heard what the Inspector General has said about this operation, would you in any way change your testimony? Mr. Traficanti. No, sir. Chairman Stokes. Reading further from the same report, Mr. Traficante, at page 27, late February-March, 1961, Roselli passed the pills to Traficante. Roselli reported to support chief that the pills had been delivered to X in Cuba. X is understood to have kept the pills for a couple of weeks before returning them. According to the gangsters, X got cold feet. Having heard this portion of the Inspector General's report, would you at this point change your testimony? Mr. Traficante. I did not give any pills to X. I did not give any money to X. I did not see X anymore since after I seen him in Cuba that one time, and I did not receive no pills from Roselli, and I don't know what else to say about that. 
Chairman Stokes. Mr. Traffic Hunty. Did you at any time receive any money for your participation in this situation? Mr. Traffic Hunty. Not a penny, no way, shape or form. Chairman Stokes. Tell us what your reason was for agreeing to act as an interpreter in this situation. Mr. Traffic Hunty. Well, I thought I was helping the US government. That is what my reason was. And as far as the gambling and monopolies of this and that and all that trash about dope and prostitution, that is not true. If things were straightened out in Cuba, I would like to have gone back there. If I could gamble, I would gamble. If I could not gamble, I would not gamble. But the reason was that I thought that it was not right for the communists to have a base 90 miles from the United States. The same reason when the First and the Second World War, they call you to go to the draft board and sign up, I signed up. That is the reason. And we all like to make money. Chairman Stokes. I do not quite understand, Mr. Trafficanti. I mean, we all like to make money. In case there was a thing I was doing it for money, for this and for that, about going back to Cuba and gamble and have casinos or cabarets, stuff like that. Chairman Stokes. In 1967, 1971, 1976 and 1977, those four years, columnist Jack Anderson wrote about the CIA mafia plots and the possibility that Castro decided to kill President Kennedy in retaliation. Mr. Anderson even contends in those articles that the same persons involved in the CIA mafia attempts on Castro's life were recruited by Castro to kill President Kennedy. The September 7, 1976, issue of the Washington Post contains one of Mr. Anderson's articles entitled Behind John F. Kennedy's Murder which fully explains Mr. Anderson's position. I ask, Mr. Chairman, that at this point, this article be marked as JFK Exhibit F409, and that it be entered into the record at this point. Mr. Prayer, without objection, the exhibit marked F409 is ordered into the record at this point. Chairman Stokes. Mr. Traficante, I want to read to you just two portions of the article I have just referred to after which I will ask for your comment. According to Mr. Anderson, it says, and Mr. Witten in this article, it. Before he died, Roselli hinted to associates that he knew who had arranged President Kennedy's murder. It was the same conspirators, he suggested, whom he had recruited earlier to kill Cuban Premier Fidel Castro. By Roselli's cryptic account, Castro learned the identity of the underworld contacts in Havana who had been trying to knock him off. He believed, not altogether without basis, that President Kennedy was behind the plot. According to Roselli, Castro enlisted the same underworld elements whom he had caught plotting against him. They supposedly were Cubans from the old Traficante organization. Working with Cuban intelligence, they allegedly lined up an ex-Marine sharpshooter, Lee Harvey Oswald, who had been active in the pro-Castro movement. According to Roselli's version, Oswald may have shot Kennedy or may have acted as a decoy while others ambushed him from closer range. When Oswald was picked up, Roselli suggested the underworld conspirators feared he would crack and disclose information that might lead to them. This almost certainly would have brought a massive US crackdown on the Mafia. So, Jack Ruby was ordered to eliminate Oswald making it appear as an act of reprisal against the president's killer. At least, this is how Roselli explained the tragedy in Dallas. Mr. Traficante, do you have any knowledge of that? Mr. Traficante, no knowledge whatsoever. Chairman Stokes, do you have any information concerning any retaliatory action by Mr. Castro? Mr. Traficante, no, sir. Chairman Stokes, do you have any knowledge concerning how this information could have been given to this columnist, Mr. Anderson? Mr. Traficante. No, sir. Chairman Stokes. Did you and Mr. Roselli ever discuss any retaliatory action by Castro? Mr. Traficante. No, sir. Chairman Stokes. Can you tell us? When was the last time you had seen Mr. Roselli prior to his death? Mr. Traficante. I would say two, three weeks before his death. Chairman Stokes. 
And where was that? Mr. Traficante, in Fort Lauderdale. Chairman Stokes. Was anyone else present? Mr. Traficante. His sister and my wife. Chairman Stokes. Can you tell us what you discussed? Mr. Traficante. Nothing. We met for, and that is it. I do not remember what we discussed. We did not discuss nothing about Castro, that's for sure. Chairman Stokes. You told us that you had known Sam Giancana for a long period of time. Mr. Traficante. I would say ten, fifteen years. I had never had nothing to do with Sam Giancana. No business relation, or either with Mr. Roselli. I never had no business relations with them either. Chairman Stokes. Mr. Giancana, prior to his death, when was the last time you had seen him? Mr. Traficante. I would say twelve, thirteen years. I did not see him for twelve or thirteen years. I had not seen Mr. Roselli, I think. I seen him once from 1961 till the time that he moved to Florida with his sister, which was about two years before he got killed. I just seen him one time during that time. Chairman Stokes Mr. Traficante, you have told us here today that your motivation for participating in the assassination of President Castro was your patriotism, your love for this country and your concerns about communism being ninety miles from our shores, is that correct? Mr. Traficante. Right. Chairman Stokes. Were you at all motivated by the events which had taken place in Havana, which caused you to lose your business interests? Mr. Traficante. No. I have been a gambler all my life, and I am used to taking chances, and it is a matter of time, it is not a matter of... It was forgotten. I doubt very much if it would have been the same again after Batista was gone. Chairman Stokes Did you ever inform any other people of the plot against Castro, besides those who were involved in the actual plot? Mr. Traficante Not that I remember. I do not think I did. Chairman Stokes What is your knowledge as to whether Castro learned about the plot? Mr. Traficante my knowledge about Castro learned about the plot. Chairman Stokes. Yes, whether he learned about it. Mr. Traficante. I cannot answer that. I would be guessing. I do not know. Chairman Stokes. Now, at any other times, were you either directly or indirectly involved in assisting any anti-Castro groups in their activities against Castro? Mr. Traficante. No, I was not. Chairman Stokes, now, you have told us that you do know Mr. Bango. He was your attorney. Mr. Traficante, right? Chairman Stokes, and how long a period of time was he your attorney? Mr. Traficante, well, he was for a short period of time, while I was in jail, while I was in Trescornia, in Havana. His brother, his brother is still, I do not know if Mr. Bango is still alive, by the way. But his brother is Minister of Sports in Cuba under Castro today, and that's a very important job under the communist system. You know, he is in charge of sports and the youth and the whole bit. Chairman Stokes. Did Mr. Bango ever represent you at any other time? Mr. Traficante. No, sir. Chairman Stokes. Do you have any knowledge of Mr. Bango travelling to Madrid, Spain, during the 1960s? Mr. Traficante. Right. I went to visit him in Spain during the 1960s, Chairman Stokes. Can you tell us about when in the 60s it was? Mr. Traficante. What part? Chairman Stokes. What part of the 1960s? Mr. Traficante. Around 1966 or 1967. Chairman Stokes. Was this in Madrid? Mr. Traficante. Madrid, yes. Chairman Stokes. And what was your purpose of going there? Mr. Traficante. Well, he had a purpose, he had a fighter, some kind of a fighter that he was interested in promoting. And then I wanted to go to Madrid, and I just went over there. Chairman Stokes, how long did you stay there? Mr. Traficante, I stayed there ten days. When I got there, I got met by the, I left from Miami. When I got there, I got met by the Spanish Secret Service or some kind of a service and they had twelve people a day under surveillance. I was constantly under surveillance from the minute I got there 
until the minute I left. They would park even in front of my door in the hotel. So, there was the trip to Spain. Chairman Stokes. I see. Chairman Stokes. Did you ever inform any other people of the plot against Castro, besides those who were involved in the actual plot? Mr. Traficante. Not that I remember. I do not think I did. Chairman Stokes. What is your knowledge as to whether Castro learned about the plot? Mr. Traficante. My knowledge about Castro learned about the plot? Chairman Stokes. Yes, whether he learned about it. Mr. Traficante. I cannot answer that. I would be guessing. I do not know. Chairman Stokes. Now at any other times, were you either directly or indirectly involved in assisting any anti-Castro groups in their activities against Castro? Mr. Traficante. No, I was not. Chairman Stokes. Now you have told us that you do know Mr. Bango. He was your attorney? Mr. Traficante. Right. Chairman Stokes. And how long a period of time was he your attorney? Mr. Traficante. Well, he was for a short period of time. While I was in jail, while I was in Trescornia in Havana. His brother, his brother is still, I do not know if Mr. Bango is still alive, by the way, but his brother is Minister of Sports in Cuba under Castro today, and that's a very important job under the communist system. You know, he is in charge of sports and youth, and the whole bit, Chairman Stokes. Did Mr. Bango ever represent you at any other time? Mr. Traficante. No, sir. Chairman Stokes. Do you have any knowledge of Mr. Bango travelling to Madrid, Spain during the 1960s? Mr. Traficante. Right, I went to visit him in Spain during the 1960s. Chairman Stokes. Can you tell us about when in the 60s it was? Mr. Traficante. What part? Chairman Stokes. What part of the 1960s? Mr. Traficante. Around 1966 or 1967? Chairman Stokes. Was this in Madrid? Mr. Traficante. Madrid, yes. Chairman Stokes. And what was your purpose of going there? Mr. Traficante. Well, he had a purpose. He had a fighter. Some kind of a fighter that he was interested in promoting. And then I wanted to go to Madrid, and I just went over there. Chairman Stokes. How long did you stay there, Mr. Traficante? I stayed there ten days. When I got there, I got met by the... I left from Miami. When I got there, I got met by the Spanish Secret Service, or some kind of a service, and they had twelve people a day under surveillance. I was constantly under surveillance from the minute I got there until the minute I left. They would park even in front of my door in the hotel. So, there was the trip to Spain. Chairman Stokes. I see. Chairman Stokes. Mr. Traficante. Do you know the person Amlash? a Cuban official involved in the CIA operation also called AMLASH, which was designed to kill Castro. Mr. Traficante. Yes, Chairman Stokes. We refer to this individual also as AMLASH. During what years did you know AMLASH, Mr. Traficante? Well, I actually met him after the revolution in Cuba because he was, he had killed somebody there, some big official of the Batista government, so he went to the mountains. And I met him after the revolution. When he came in, he was made a co Mr. Traficante. Right? Chairman Stokes. And how long a period of time was he your attorney? Mr. Traficante. Well, he was for a short period of time. While I was in jail. While I was in Trescornia in Havana. His brother. His brother is still... I do not know if Mr. Bango is still alive, by the way but his brother is Minister of Sports in Cuba, under Castro today, and that's a very important job under the communist system. You know, he is in charge of sports and the youth and the whole bit. Chairman Stokes, did Mr. Bango ever represent you at any other time? Mr. Traficante, no, sir. Chairman Stokes, do you have any knowledge of Mr. Bango travelling to Madrid, Spain, during the 1960s? Mr. Traficante, right. I went to visit him in Spain during the 1960s. Chairman Stokes. Can you tell us about when in the 60s it was? Mr. Traficante. What part? Chairman Stokes. What part of the 1960s? Mr. Traficante. 
around 1966 or 1967. Chairman Stokes, was this in Madrid? Mr. Traficante, Madrid, yes. Chairman Stokes, and what was your purpose of going there? Mr. Traficante, well, he had a purpose. He had a fighter, some kind of a fighter that he was interested in promoting. And then I wanted to go to Madrid, and I just went over there. Chairman Stokes, how long did you stay there? Mr. Traficante, I stayed there ten days. When I got there I got met by the... I left from Miami when I got there. I got met by the Spanish Secret Service or some kind of a service, and they had twelve people a day under surveillance. I was constantly under surveillance from the minute I got there until the minute I left. They would park even in front of my door in the hotel. So, there was the trip to Spain, Chairman Stokes. And after you met him, was a relationship established between the two of you? Mr. Traficante. No, just a hello and goodbye and that is it. Chairman Stokes. Did he ever represent your interests or assist you in any manner? Mr. Traficante. No, sir. Chairman Stokes. Do you know whether Castro was aware of the Amlash plot prior to President Kennedy's death? Mr. Traficante. No, sir. Chairman Stokes. Do you know if Amlash knew Mr. Bango? Mr. Traficante. I am sure he did. Chairman Stokes. And do you know the nature of their relationship? Mr. Traficante. No, sir. Chairman Stokes. Can you tell us whether or not you know whether Amlash travelled to Madrid, Spain in either 1964, 1965 or 1966? Mr. Traficante. Well, what I'm going to tell you now is what I read and, you know, it has been coming out. So I do not know if he travelled there or nothing. I found out later he had. Chairman Stokes. Do you know for what purpose he went there? Mr. Traficante. What is that? Chairman Stokes. Do you know for what purpose he went there to Madrid, Mr. Traficante? He was some kind of a diplomat. He was of stature enough to be able to travel to Madrid and Paris and all those places. In my opinion, he was not a communist. He was a communist. I always believed sooner or later he would react against Castro. But as far as I have any knowledge or contact with him, or my personal knowledge knowing he used to travel back and forth, Maybe Bango must have mentioned it to me or something like that. But I never did see him in Paris, in Madrid, or any place. Chairman Stokes Mr. Traficante, after January 1st, 1962, and prior to November 22, 1963, did you have contacts with any Cuban official concerning any business dealings? Mr. Traficante, 1962 to 1963. Chairman Stokes Yes, sir, from January 1962 to November of 1963. Mr. Traficante. Not that I remember. Cuban officials in Cuba, you mean. Chairman Stokes. Right, with Cuban officials in Cuba. Mr. Traficante. No, sir. Chairman Stokes. The answer is no, sir, right? Mr. Traficante. Mr. Aylman stated that you paid Castro's G2 agents in the Miami area. Have you ever given any aid or assistance to individuals you know or suspected were working for Fidel Castro after January 1st, 1962? and prior to November 22, 1963. Mr. Traficante, absolutely not, never. Chairman Stokes, Mr. Aylerman also stated to this committee that he has no doubt that there is an affiliation between the Castro government and yourself. Mr. Traficante, there is no affiliation whatsoever between Castro government and me. There never has been. Chairman Stokes, now, let us return for a moment to your detention in Trescornia. I understand you saying your wife has visited you there. Did any other people visit you there? Mr. Traficante. Well, a lot of people visited me there. People that I knew in Cuba. Chairman Stokes. These would be friends of yours in Cuba who visited with you during that time? Mr. Traficante. Yes. Chairman Stokes. Were most of them people that had some involvement with you in the gambling operations? Mr. Traficante. Right. Chairman Stokes. When people visited with you, can you tell us about that visiting room? Would there be other people in that same room? 
Other visitors visiting detainees. Mr. Trafficante. Let me tell you, Mr. Stokes, this was like a camp. There was no... It was a minimum security place. They would let anybody come in. They would let anybody stay with us until 12 o'clock at night. We would cook, we would have food brought in, we would eat, we would drink. And there would be, sometimes, the guards would come and sit down with us and eat. Some meals were like one big happy family. Chairman Stokes. It sounds like a resorteria, Mr. Trafficanti. It was. I really had a rest then if you want to know the truth. I enjoyed it. It was the highest point in the whole Havana area. You could see the whole city. It was cool, too, in the evening. Chairman Stokes. Do you know a Mr. Meyer Panitz? Mr. Trafficante. Who? Chairman Stokes. Meyer Panitz. P-A-N-I-T-Z. Mr. Gonzalez. Is that P-A-N, Mr. Chairman? Chairman Stokes. Yes, Mr. Gonzalez. P-A-N-I-T-Z. First name. Meyer. M-E-Y-E-R. Mr. Trafficante. No, sir, it does not ring a bell. Chairman Stokes. You did know Pedro and Martin Fox? Mr. Trafficante. Pedro Fox, yes, sir. Chairman Stokes. Do you know whether the Fox brothers or any of the other operators tried to get their money out of Cuba during this period of time? Mr. Trafficante. All I know is that Mr. Martin Fox, who was the owner of the Tropicana and one of the richest men in Cuba, he died in the United States in the 1960s, I think, and he died completely broke. And Pedro Fox was working as a waiter and maitre in all the restaurants and hotels around Miami. Chairman Stokes. If during this period of time any of these operators were able to get their money out of Cuba, are you aware of how they did it? Mr. Trafficante. No, sir. You see, can I explain something? Chairman Stokes. Certainly, go ahead, Mr. Trafficante. You see, everybody that was in business in Cuba, Castro started with the very, very rich, and he knocked them out of the box so everybody would say, well, maybe he won't touch me. Then he started with the next in line. Meanwhile, they still trying to do business, and eventually he did it in a real way. Then he would invite all the tourist agents, and he was going to make a big tourist campaign to bring the people from all over the world to Cuba. He was going to do this, he was going to do that. Then next time, meanwhile, the employees of these places would be taking over that business, and they would run the business. And if you had a little money in the cage, you could not even go near the cage to get the money because they would report to you right away. So, everybody got fooled to a certain point. Because if you remember, he did not declare he was a communist until about 1962, 1963. Sometime like that, 1961 or 1962. So, there were not too many people that got their money out unless they had it out. Chairman Stokes, I see. Thank you. Mr. Trafficante, did you know while you were in Trescornia, a Britisher named John Wilson Hudson, who was detained along with you? Mr. Trafficante, let me tell you what used to happen. I vaguely remember some guy there that was kind of a little bit of a screwball. I do not know if it is him or not. Because there used to be all kinds of people they would bring into their people that would have difficulty with the travelling papers. In other words, they would get at the airport, then they did not have a ticket to leave the country. So, they would get them and bring them over there until they got the problem straightened out, and continuously we would have different people coming in and out and staying for a few days and then leaving. Coming. Staying. So, it could be possible that he was there. But if I were to see him now, I would not remember none of these people. Chairman Stokes. Then if I understand you properly, you do not remember this precise individual. But it is possible. Mr. Trafficante. Right. It's possible that he was there. Chairman Stokes. Do you know a Lewis McWilly? Mr. Trafficante. Yes, sir, I have seen him around Havana a lot. Chairman Stokes. Can you recall when you first met him? Mr. Trafficante. He was working at the Tropicana for Martin Fox. Chairman Stokes. Did you have any personal business dealings with Lewis McWilly? Mr. Trafficante. Never had any personal business dealings. Chairman Stokes. 
Have you ever had occasion to talk with him, Mr. Trafficanti? Ever since Cuba, I think I seen him one time in Vegas at his home. Somebody took me there, said I want to meet somebody from Havana that you know just for a few minutes. Chairman Stokes, during the period that you were detained at Trescornia, do you recall seeing Louis McWillie visiting out there? Mr. Trafficanti, I do not recall it, but he might have come. He might have. Chairman Stokes, so if he was there visiting someone, you do not recall it? Mr. Trafficanti, that is right, I do not recall it. It is possible that he did, but I do not recall it. Chairman Stokes, Mr. Trafficante, did you ever know a Jack Ruby? Mr. Trafficante, no, sir, I never remember meeting Jack Ruby. Chairman Stokes, never remember meeting him. Mr. Trafficante, no. Chairman Stokes, are you aware it has been alleged that Jack Ruby visited with you while you were at Trescornia? Have you heard that? Mr. Trafficante, I have heard that, but I do not remember him visiting me either. There was no reason for this man to visit me. I have never seen this man before. I have never been to Dallas. I never had no contact with him. I do not see why he was going to visit me. Chairman Stokes. Were you aware of any of the activities of a Jack Ruby? Mr. Trafficanti. No, sir. Chairman Stokes. When you first met McWilly, can you tell us where that was? Mr. Trafficanti. I met him around Cuba someplace. Chairman Stokes, I am sorry. Mr. Trafficanti, I met him around Cuba in a casino someplace. Chairman Stokes, did he ever visit you in your home, or did you ever visit him in his home? Mr. Trafficanti, no, sir. The only time I think was one time in Vegas. Like I told you, I was there for a day or two in the 1960s. He was already working over there. And, Chairman Stokes, in Vegas? Mr. Trafficante. Yeah, in Vegas. A fellow said he had already married a Cuban girl or something like that. I see him there just for a few minutes. That was the only time that I remember seeing him since the Cuban days. That you were detained at Trescornia. Do you recall seeing Louis McWilly visiting out there? Mr. Trafficante. I do not recall it, but he might have come. He might have. Mr. Trafficante. Yeah, I do not think it can be stopped. Chairman Stokes. Did you ever have any discussions with Mr. Marcello regarding President Kennedy or Attorney General Robert Kennedy? Mr. Trafficante. I probably had it with him about Robert Kennedy. Chairman Stokes. Can you tell us what that conversation was? Mr. Trafficante. The conversation was that Bobby Kennedy had him deported illegally put him on a plane with some marshals, and dumped him in Guatemala. That was the conversation. Chairman Stokes. And by him, you are referring to Mr. Marcello? Mr. Trafficante. Mr. Marcello, right? Chairman Stokes. Obviously then, from what he said to you, he was pretty upset about that. Mr. Trafficante. Well, I would be too. What happened to him would happen to me. Chairman Stokes. And is this what you said to him when the two of you talked about it? Mr. Trafficante. Right. Chairman Stokes. You felt that Robert Kennedy had mistreated him. Mr. Trafficante. I think so. He mistreated him. Chairman Stokes. Are you aware of any threats that Mr. Martello made against President Kennedy or Attorney General Kennedy? Mr. Trafficante. How was that, Mr. Stokes? Chairman Stokes, as a result of these conversations you had with Mr. Marcello, the fact that he was upset. Mr. Trafficante, right. Chairman Stokes, you were upset about it. Are you aware of any threats made by Mr. Marcello against either President Kennedy or Attorney General Kennedy? Mr. Trafficante, no, sir, no, no chance, no way. Chairman Stokes, Mr. Trafficante, do you know a man by the name of Jose Aleman? Mr. Trafficante. Well, I met Mr. Aleman. It was two or three times, perhaps. Chairman Stokes. Can you tell us when you first met him? Mr. Trafficante. Well, I met him. I do not remember what year it was. 
It was in the early 60s. Chairman Stokes. Can you tell us where you first met him? Mr. Trafficanti. I met him at his... He had an apartment house or condominium or hotel or something. Chairman Stokes. And how did you happen to be at his home? Mr. Trafficanti. I met him through Macho Jaina. Chairman Stokes. Mr. Jaina took you there? Mr. Trafficanti. Yes. Chairman Stokes. And can you tell us the purpose of his taking you there? Mr. Trafficanti. This fellow was in a financial bind. Mr. Alman was having trouble financially. He wanted to raise some money because he was having trouble with his stepmother or something. So Macho liked Mr. Alleman. That is the reason that he took me there. Chairman Stokes, can you tell us how much money Mr. Alleman needed? Mr. Trafficanter. Well, we never got to the point, because when I got there I found out. I do not even think he owned the property. The property belonged to his stepmother. It was like a clouded title in a property. Chairman Stokes. Well, was it Mr. Alman wanted you to arrange a loan for him? Mr. Trafficanti. He thought maybe I could arrange a loan for him, yeah. Chairman Stokes. From whom were you going to arrange the loan? Mr. Trafficanti. Well, at that particular time I was. My attorney, Mr. Frank Gargano, was an attorney for Jimmy Hoffa, and I thought maybe I could talk to him. I thought I could talk to my attorney to see if he could help Mr. Aylman. Chairman Stokes. And this would be a loan then from the Teamsters? Mr. Trafficanti. Right. Chairman Stokes. And had you ever arranged loans for other people through the Teamsters? Mr. Trafficanti. No, sir. Chairman Stokes. You do not recall. Is this your testimony? You do not recall the amount that Alleman asked for? Mr. Trafficanti. No, I do not. Chairman Stokes. How many meetings took place between you and Mr. Elman regarding this loan? Mr. Trafficante. I would say the question of the loan was decided the first time I met him. But then I went there. I met him another couple of times. I do not remember meeting him in any restaurant like he testified yesterday. Maybe it could be, though. I am not saying. It could be, but I don't. Chairman Stokes. Is it your best recollection, then, that you probably met with him about three times? Mr. Trafficante. Two or three times. Chairman Stokes. And Mr. Gaynor was present for the first meeting. Would he have been present for the other two meetings? Mr. Trafficante. Mr. Jaina was present at all the times that I spoke with Mr. Alman. To the best of my recollection, he was present. Chairman Stokes. And was anyone else present on those occasions? Mr. Trafficante. There was another gentleman present I cannot, Chairman Stokes. Do you know his name? Mr. Trafficante. No. Well, I will tell you his nickname was Coco. That is how this was a friend of Mr. Bango this Coco. No, no, Darcy. I read in the paper was supposed to be. Mr. Trafficante. Maybe that is him. Maybe that is the same guy. It was a dark-complexioned guy. Chairman Stokes. How about Angelo Bruno? Was he ever present? Mr. Trafficante. He was present one time, yes. Chairman Stokes. So that, just for the record, would you name everybody that you can recall being present? Mr. Trafficante. That is about it. I do not think there was anybody else. Chairman Stokes. Okay, just for the record, you name each of the people you say were present. Mr. Trafficante. Macho Jaina, this fellow Coco, uh, I think, Nobrigas, whatever it is, Alleman, and Angelo Bruno, I think, was present one time. Chairman Stokes. And on each occasion was the purpose of the meeting to discuss Alleman's loan? Mr. Trafficante. No, sir. Chairman Stokes. What was the purpose? Mr. Trafficante. The next time, one of the purposes I seen him after the loan, because like I told you, I think the matter of the loan, it was decided the first time I met him. Then he mentioned something about having some political influence in the Dominican Republic. So Mr. Bruno had talked to me that he was interested in getting some milk from the Dominican Republic. So I took him over there to meet Mr. Aylman. So maybe they could get together.
Mr. Aylman could facilitate this thing of the milk to get an export license to export milk from the Dominican Republic. Chairman Stokes. Wasn't Aleman already in trouble financially? Mr. Traficante. Yes, but that has nothing to do with it. He could have made maybe some money with Mr. Bruno if he could get him the export license. To the best of my recollection, now that is the way it was. Chairman Stokes. Was this the export deal that had something to do with milk? Mr. Traficanti. Milk. Chairman Stokes. Was there anything else you discussed at that time? Mr. Traficanti. As far as the Kennedy situation, I want to tell you something now, Mr. Stokes. I am sure as I am sitting here that all the discussion I had with Mr. Alleman, that I never made the statement that Kennedy was going to get hit. Because all the discussion I had with Mr. Alleman, as sure as I am sitting here, I spoke to him in Spanish. No reason for me to talk to him in English because I can speak Spanish fluently and he speaks Spanish, which is his language. There was no reason for me to tell him in English that Kennedy is going to get hit. I deny that I made that statement. Chairman Stokes When did you first become aware that he had made the statement? Mr. Traficanti When it was first published in some newspaper, The Post, or The Times, two or three years ago. Chairman Stokes, were you aware of the fact that he had also told the FBI about it much earlier than that? Mr. Traficanti, I read it in the same article, I think, that he was an FBI informant at that time. Chairman Stokes, are you aware of the fact that he said that he had had a very involved discussion with you about politics? Did you ever discuss politics? Mr. Traficante, I do not remember having that discussion with him by himself, like he claims like I read it in the paper. Chairman Stokes, when we take the statement that he attributes to you, when he says that you said he is not going to be re-elected, and then when he says you said, no, Jose, he is going to be hit, how could he in any way mistake a statement like that from anything else you have said to him? Mr. Traficante. Because first of all, like I told you, I was speaking to him in Spanish, and in Spanish there was no way I could say Kennedy is going to get hit. I did not say that. I might have told him he was not going to get re-elected. Chairman Stokes. What were you basing that on? Mr. Traficante. I could have told him that, but I did not tell him that Kennedy was going to get hit. I will see him after the loan because, like I told you, I think the matter of the loan it was decided the first time I met him. Then he mentioned something about having some political influence in the Dominican Republic. So Mr. Bruno had talked to me that he was interested in getting some milk from the Dominican Republic, so I took him over there to meet Mr. Aylerman, so maybe they could get together. Chairman Stokes How did you know Kennedy was not going to get re-elected? Mr. Traficante I thought he would not. Chairman Stokes what had he done at that time that would cause him not to be re-elected? Mr. Traficante At this particular time, first of all, there was the Cuban question. Where they had the trouble with the Bay of Pigs and all that, and they established the Cuban bases, and if you recall there was a lot of people criticising it. Chairman Stokes Well then, Mr. Traficante, that is the best way that I could say it if I even told him that. Chairman Stokes, from what you have said here today then, in all probability, you did say to him, no, Jose, he is not going to be re-elected. Did you say that? Mr. Traficante, I might have told him that, but I did not tell him that Kennedy was going to get hit. Chairman Stokes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions. Mr. Prayer, if you will pardon us for a moment. I would like to confer with the members here. There are no further questions from the panel. Under the House rules, Mr. Traficante, a witness at the conclusion of the questioning, is entitled to make a statement for five minutes to explain his testimony, or to clarify it, or to make any sort of statement he may choose to make. At this time, do you care to say anything further to the committee? Mr. Traficante. No, sir, Your Honour, nothing. Mr. Prayer. 
Very well, the committee will excuse the witness at this time. Let me caution everyone in the hearing room to remain seated until the witness leaves the hearing room. You are excused, Mr. Trafficante. Mr. Trafficante. Thank you. Mr. Prayer. Thank you for being here. Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the exhibit. Document handed to the clerk by Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, this is the certified copy of the order. Mr. Prayer, we will have that immunity order which has previously been inserted in the record. The committee will take a brief three-minute in-place recess at this time. We will resume very quickly. The committee stands in recess. A short recess was taken. Chairman Stokes, now presiding. The committee will come to order. The chair recognizes Professor Blakey. Mr. Blakey. Mr. Chairman, the testimony of Santos Traficante concludes that part of the presentation by the staff to the committee of the basic outlines of the committee's investigation into the possibility of organized crime connection to the assassination of President Kennedy. As all can see from the testimony introduced, the question remains, was organized crime involved in a plot to assassinate President Kennedy? Did it have the motive, opportunity, and means to do so? Thank you for joining us in this intriguing journey through history. If you found this content engaging and thought-provoking, we invite you to stay tuned for more fascinating stories and insights. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow to stay connected with our ongoing explorations. Your support is greatly appreciated and we look forward to sharing more captivating narratives with you in the future.